There's no thinking about what we should be thinking about as Baha'is is always interesting. First of all, I think it never it never hurts so, to reflect on how fortunate we are with them politically and socially and all those things. Uh, it's important to remember how fortunate we are to be Baha'is. Surely if any of us told has said to the pilgrims that at, at times the Baha'is get the impression that they're needed, you know, that the faith needs us. He said it's really not the case. Faith doesn't need us. It's we who need the faith. And I think when you think about the 24-hour cycles that are going on in our lives and so on, and how often we, when things get rough, is when we get spiritual. It's strange how that works. If there's no hard times, we relax a lot and enjoy ourselves. But when there's trials and difficulties and deaths and sickness, and we get busy with our prayer books. And it reminds me of um, a tablet I saw at Abdul Baha in answer to a woman who had written him previously saying that her husband was ill and please pray for him that he'll be all right. And Abdul Baha wrote back and said he would pray for him. Some months later the man died. The lady wrote a fairly strong letter to the master saying, I asked you to pray that he would live and now he's dead. What is that? How is that? What kind of answer is that? Abdu'l-Bahá said, if all the people that were destined to die didn't die and they stayed in this world, the next world would be empty. <laughs> and, and suggested that she conform herself to the will of God. It's like that and with us too, I think. We have things that befall us. He tells us that the tests are sent us so, so that we do develop. And in pain we seem to develop. No pain, no gain, as the phrase goes. And uh, so also we need to be grateful for that, grateful that we've found the faith, grateful that so many of you have been born into Baha'i families, grateful that some of you who've grown up in Baha'i families have found that the faith is theirs as well, not simply Baha'i Zadehs, but actually have recognized that this is their faith as well. I think this is one of the reasons that the House of Justice stresses service for youth to get out and do something on their own because then they have to start leaning on God. They have to start recognizing the purpose of life and asking themselves all kinds of questions. Very good process. House of Justice has said that um, despite we hear sometimes from members of institutions and others that the older people can feed the youth and can drive them around but let the youth do the work. But that I, I want, I'm here to say I don't think that's correct. I don't think that's what the house wants. Wants all of us to be teaching the faith. And if it doesn't, it would be contradicting Baha'u'llah, who says you should center your energies in the propagation of the faith until you're 25. I didn't see that. The not until 25 isn't there. It's just center your energies in the propagation of the faith. And you say to yourself, well, I'm in this, I go to the cycles of growth, but nothing much happens. And I, 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 I'm not a speaker, so I can't give talks. But Baha'u'llah doesn't say anything like this. He says, proclaim the faith to everyone. And if they show interest, then teach them. This is an interesting, in the gleanings, that that's the way that's stated. We can all, we don't have to have much knowledge to proclaim the existence of the faith. To be able to include something simple like, God has sent a new messenger, his name is Baha'u'llah, and he's given a message which solves the problems of the world. That's what the Baha'is believe. And someone will say, well, that's very interesting. What, what does he teach? Maybe. Or they may say to you, so I'm so glad you found something you like. <laughs> which is sometimes the answer you get. <laughs> now, Baha'u'llah says, if they show interest, and you may not 
not want to be quite as direct as that, but say that sometimes in a conversation you can say, well, I always remember what Baha'u'llah said about this subject. You haven't heard of the faith nor Baha'u'llah, but you drop it in the conversation simply that way, saying, he says that we're destined to reach peace through travail and difficulties. Well, finally, peace will be established because we're all one people. Stop. If they say, what's that? Who, who did you say? Shoghi Fendi said, use material that prompts a question back, if you can. It's a psychologic, it's, it's, it's the best way. Otherwise, we're really informing people that such a thing exists. And we don't come at it with a punch to try to convince them that they should follow it. That's not the Baha'i way. The Baha'i way is to lay out the proofs and the signs, talk about it. If the people find it interesting, talk about more about it. I, I, le I learned an interesting lesson from Dr. Fanon Alpazir, one of the guys in the East Coast. He's written a book recently called Islam at the Crossroads. He's so... What could you say? Unpushy. You know, not, not, not working at anything he, when he talks about the faith. And he'll have a circle of doctors and begin talking about the faith and say, well, how, how do you view this? this? This is this and this is this. And he talks about Judaism and Christianity and Islam, short things. Shows how it's all connected in such a nice way. Uh, one of the doctors that had heard one of these conversations. He said, he leaves you no room to move. You either have to say, yes, this is good, and do something about it, or say, no, it's not good. You can't waffle around in the middle, and that's a very good position to put people in when, when you're teaching them. You can't wiggle out of it and say, well, I, I'm not interested in religion. Whatever. I'm not interested in the religion that you're not interested in. That's a terrible thing. Generally, people reject religions because they have a very negative idea about it. And rightfully enough, given the state of mankind at the moment, what people believe, what people do in the name of religion, I'm surprised the room is full of people here. Except that we know there's, the faith is something different. We've been reading some texts here among some friends this morning about the obligatory prayers and fasting. You know, Shoghi Fendi says, we've come to this world to gain spirituality, that our spiritual lives could awaken. And in these phrases, the Master is saying that obligatory and fasting are like two pillars that hold up the spiritual life of man. And that they are the foundation of the faith of God. Social teachings, yes, are wonderful, but the foundation of the faith of God is obligatory prayer and fasting because they are conducive to spirituality. They proffer the water of life. They transform our old ways of thinking and thought into new ones. Terrific transformative power. And so he says, no one should neglect these. The fasting and the obligatory prayer should be very faithfully followed. And it leads to these great rewards. Shoghi Effendi, in a letter written to a Baha'i youth, has said that the great challenge of youth in the modern world is the challenge of spirituality. Because everything around us is oriented to a material point of view, a materialistic point of view. I don't know if you've heard Shoghi Effendi over and over in his writings, of course it's fairly clear, but the, the very terse, direct way he said it in the Holy Land, he used to say, the greatest enemy of the faith is materialism. Why is that? You know, you could have enemies that are out killing us. And doing he said, no, materialism is the greatest enemy. Why is that? Because the society we live in has rejected belief in general. Oh, we know part of that is the cause of that is 
what the religions have done, how they've acted, how the clergy have acted, all kinds of things. Some good reasons. But most of, mostly the earlier generations, they kept a personal faith in God, but they knew there was God. They didn't reject God. They didn't replace God with the joy of acquiring material possessions. They didn't replace spirituality, the change and transformation of human character, with the acquisition of goods, with position in society as the aims of life. Now, I, I'm sure you, you, in thinking about it, you realize how, how we are under the influence of a very materialistic science. Not that science doesn't base itself on natural laws and matter, but the emphasis of it and the atheistic overtone that you know, we don't know if God exists, if God doesn't exist, but how that affects the way the news is given to us, the social media, the writings of novels, everything places God for the most part in a back seat somewhere, if it allows at all the existence of God and spiritual matters. So they're not seen as very important. And we take that. Many of you have been born in Baha'i family, so you didn't have that same influence. Although it's deadly, it's around us everywhere because everybody we talk to has kind of had that background. We have taken it as children from things we see around us, from the children we play with, from the pattern of life that children have that doesn't include God and prayer, and some do, but not so often. So we were raised, you know, with, I want to be like so-and-so who has lots of money or who invented great things for mankind. Sorry, so we all have to have our jobs, we have to do the things we have to do, but do we realize how much this society influences us? In school, teachers are not, they don't incorporate the dimension of God or spirituality at all. You say, well, how are they going to do that? It, it really, right now, it's very difficult to do. But that creates an impression in the child, of the, in the minds of the children, that these said that's not important. Or they say, well, that's for a Sunday, or you can study that in church, not here. Then we grow up a little older and the youth are carried away and we lose them to materialism, to hedonism, to the expression of sexuality in excess, that the whole, our whole identity is gender identity. The answer to people who say, what do you believe about this and that, is to say we believe that gender identity is spiritual identity and we're all the same. And all the other variations are something secondary. And that man has been created here to be educated by the messengers of God and to move on renewed and elevated through that message to the spiritual realms, which he says are infinite and everlasting. This is very part-time activity here we have. Although it's very crucial because what you do with free will in this world sets the pattern of what's going to happen to you when you pass on. The law of God, the teachings of God are there before us to choose. Abdul Baha gave an example. He said that uh, free will, we're given free will. First of all, let us say that the Bob says that we have given you free will. God says we've given you free will so that you might choose the will of God. Any other use of free will is illicit, unacceptable. That's strange. We want, we're, we're perfectly willing to follow, use our will and follow our self-will, follow our desires, follow all the things we want to do. But he says this uh, free will that we've been given is there to choose the will of God. And as far as I understand, friends, that happens many times a day. We may not realize how many times a day every choice we make. Did we smile at the person that smiled to us coming out of the supermarket? 
meet your fellow um, people who live here and meet them with a bright and friendly face for how lessons. Did we do that? Did we did we feel compassion for a situation we saw in the street? Or we had a call and somebody said, I want you to come and do something. And we said, oh, I'm busy. Not busy at all, but we said we're busy. We made ourselves busy to not respond to this request. Simple little lie, but it breaks the will of God. It goes against it. So we're making these decisions constantly every day. And the Bob says that at the end of the day, when we bring ourselves to account, we should examine what we've done during the day and try to recall anything that we did that might be pleasing to God. And we might have to search around a little bit. We try. And if we find something, he says we should praise God and thank him for that. And ask him to strengthen us in performing good actions. And if we find we've not We've fallen short of our duties of, of kindness and service and even, you know, God forbid, gross sins and mistakes. He says, then ask God for forgiveness. Review those things. Ask Him for forgiveness and ask Him for strength, the Bob says, to do better tomorrow. And if we leave the account for the end of our life and we don't do that every day or often, then they the thing builds up, you know. Now, we can't be too harsh on ourselves. Jesus, Abdul Baha says, this is not a world of perfections, of human perfections. I like that line. That's the one I feel like I could fulfill generally. I <laughs> able to. And as it's not a world of perfections, our mistakes and imperfections are part of the reality of this existence. And whereas we need to <coughs> take note of our shortcomings, of our failings, and ask forgiveness for them, we shouldn't let them paralyze us. We shouldn't say, well, the things I've done in my life, I was a businessman, you know, I don't want to tell you about that. And I don't feel like I can open my mouth and talk about the faith because I just don't have that kind of goodness in me. There's nothing like that and no excuse like that in the writings. There's lots of admonitions that we're supposed to straighten our lives out, that's for sure. But we might be able to deliver the message, whatever the vehicle is, you know. I asked Abdu'l-Bahá, how did Judas Is Iscariot this terrific traitor that betrayed Christ, how did he, he was such a good teacher, he was known as one of the outstanding teachers. How did he do it? Abu Bahá said, because of the word of God, the effect of the word of God that he repeated had the power, not Judas Iscariot. It's the same thing, we want to take in as much as we can of the divine verses so we can, our breath will have this effect. Abu Bahá the divine plan, I don't see any place where he says, that you should hand out pamphlets to people. What does he say? Breathe life into the souls of others. Become incarnate light. Now through this conforming daily living, you know, we're supposed to bring our, bend our will, which is completely attracted at the beginning with ego and self-love and desire and carnal desire particularly, he's, he emphasized over and over, he says, these are the two veils that keep you from seeing God. Maybe you remember Mr. Sears, he used to ask the friends, he says, if you don't feel as close to God as you used to, who moved? <laughs> God hasn't gone anywhere. But we become veiled by attending to these lower aspects of our, of our character and of our being. And in a society which is very permissive and where that thing happens all the time, it doesn't seem so bad to us. We're not wrong, everybody's doing it. We make the reason, makes excuses for us, so to speak. It causes us to 
make light of some of the things. Yeah, it's a little lie, it's not so much, you know, it doesn't hurt anybody and it saves me some trouble. No, it's this absolute truthfulness, you know, get to the bottom of it. He allows lying in the case of doctors telling patients that they're going to get better when they're not going to get better. Because telling them they're not going to get better is the cause of their weakening them of getting and getting worse, you know, so. So how do, how do we move forward the admonitions of the guardian, particularly in, in a, a compilation the House of Justice made years ago called The Power of Divine Assistance. He sets forth three principles for teaching the cause. Says, the first principle is you must not focus on your shortcomings. Because if you think how bad you are or how inadequate you are or how ignorant you are, he said it paralyzes you. You won't be able to do anything. So then what should we fix it? Fix our attention on it. He says, put your attention on the promises of Baha'u'llah, the promises of Abdul Baha about the teaching her. Rehearse those. And and that fills you with with hope. Anybody that arises in a host of angels will come and assist you. Uh, he says that, uh, that, of course, inherent in this is the study of the promises, is the study of the Word of God. Baha'u'llah says, everyone should arise to teach. When they arise to teach, the first job is what? Pray is surely, that's right there. Any others you think of? When you arise to teach, what's the first thing you should do? It's not fair to, I'm not here really to test you out. Teach ourselves, huh? teach ourselves first. That's exactly, that's what he says. When you arise to teach, the first thing you need to do is teach your own self. <laughs> and when you bring your life then into conformity with the uh, divine teachings, and you read and you study the proofs, and you study the, the texts, then that causes this transformation in you. And he says, then your words will take effect in the hearts of the listeners. So, if we're busy telling about the faith and from time to time we hear ourselves and we hear others saying, I tell everybody about the faith, but nobody's interested, you know. It's more an indictment about our, how, how well we've taught ourselves rather than how well we've taught the other person. Because if we're filled with it, if we're, if we're the embodiment of Baha'u'llah's spirit, he says that we're using you to spread the faith around the world. Baha'u'llah couldn't go everywhere. Abdul Baha couldn't go everywhere. Still don't be discouraged if they don't respond. Think. They estimate 90,000 people in America saw Abdul Baha and heard him speak. This should have been a transformation of human society on the whole planet. Shoghi Effendi to the pilgrims, he was saying, and to the friends in the Holy Land, he says, Abdul Baha, his mission was a failure. I think it was startled. I don't want to say that. But he said, no, not Abdul Baha's failure. It was the failure of the people to respond to the center of the covenant of God's covenant. He was displayed himself all over. He spoke. No excuse for anyone, Abdul Baha wrote himself. He, he, he said to the friends, he said, it's in the newspapers, the talks are in the newspapers, the news of it something could have sparked that capacity that you have to be interested and curious and go forward and think about it. But they did. And what happened? The world plunged into the worst war in its history, the First World War. Of course, we had another worse than that afterwards. Still, because the people didn't respond, it wasn't enough. And Shani Fendi said the Second World, wasn't, world War wasn't enough either. It didn't change. It changed the hearts of many people. It brought about the birth of the United Nations, but then the United Nations has gone off in other directions and has its own difficulties. So that's going to, we're going to have another round of suffering. We don't know how much. We don't know when. We don't know the exact character of it. Thou said there's no way to tell what the timing will be. But it's an important part, the ordeal, the universal ordeal that mankind has to go through is an important part in changing their hearts. Now just look at the
calamities of the political scene in America in the last six months or so on, how many people are asking questions and thinking about things that they weren't thinking about before? Because they're getting frightened. What's going to happen to us? When it's just easy. And this country has it particularly easy now it's because it's supposed to lead the world spiritually was the promise of Abdu'l Baha. Rabbi Kandi says it's going to lead the world spiritually through suffering. So we'll have to see where it's going to go. These, these uh, months and years ahead, immediately ahead, I think, are very crucial ones. And as you know, the House of Justice has asked the Baha'is to make a Herculean effort. We're already trying our best, but now we have to do something more. And Abdul Baha goes even further than that. He says, whatever you've been doing, I now ask of you, increase it a thousandfold. You say, a thousandfold what I'm doing, how am I going to do that? The master is asking us, how is it possible that he could ask us? That doesn't sound reasonable. But when you see the other promises he makes, how through divine confirmations, an atom becomes the sun and a drop becomes an ocean, a fly becomes an eagle, there are those promises of terrific transformation if you arise and serve them. In one place, I think Shri Rukhini a bit frustrated in the middle of the crusade, he said, let the doubter arise and put the promises to proof. Have we done it? Have we invoked these things? Have we all the prayers of the divine plan ask, the, ask have us invoke these things? Have us ask? transform me, make me different, make, make me able to diffuse the divine fragrances, to spread the beauty of the faith everywhere. This is ter terrific challenge. That was a, so we've got the first, don't look at your shortcomings. The second one, look to the divine promises. What's the third one, he said? Move, get up, arise, do something. Put yourself in motion. I remember when I was a new car, new, no, it was a new car. Uh, you'll understand why I said that. Because the Baha'i said that when you're a new Baha'i and you, 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 it's as if you now have a vehicle, the faith is your vehicle. And he says, you're asking, you're begging for guidance. He said, but you haven't put the engine on. You're not moving anywhere. How's God going to steer you and guide you? You have to put yourself in motion. Then he can correct you if you're not doing the right thing. And I saw a marvelous something in the comments of Abdu'l Baha where he said that the God's mercy is so great that he can even use the mistakes of the sincere ones for the progress of the faith. That's very hopeful and we can all qualify <laughs> in that category. I'm sure it was great. great huh? <laughs> so he says, arise and act and trust, put your trust in him. And that's so many the gleanings is full of those promises and you know, all if you realize how to do it so it's really amazing think of simple people like martha root was she was a reporter she wasn't terribly charismatic or anything i talked to some people who had <coughs> when i became a baha'i back in the 50s that had seen martha root and they said she was very plain and one of them said she was frumpy. <laughs> Not very well put together, but she'd get up on the platform and she'd open her mouth and she'd start talking about Baha'u'llah and, and she'd change into light. And the people would be thrilled with her. She tells a story about herself. And this leads us into the question of sacrifice. Next, we'll talk about that. And she came to, to uh, the Bay Area. She'd come from Hawaii across the Pacific, she'd been in Australia or China or someplace because she was everywhere. And she came to San Francisco and she found she had change in her pocket. It's the only thing she had. We could pay for the streetcar to get to the Baha'i meeting where she was supposed to speak. And she said, okay, we'll see what will happen after that. And she, she said, I went to the meeting, I paid the streetcar, I got to the meeting, I went, I gave this Baha'i talk. Uh, in the audience was a society lady who had a 
an estate outside the city. And she was so taken with the talk that she came and begged Martha Root, come home with us, stay with us, teach my family, explain these teachings to my, to my relatives. So Martha Root said, that must be the indication of what I'm supposed to do next, you know, because she didn't have anything else to do. She had one dress for some period she was traveling. She would wash the dress and go to bed and hang it up and let it dry and put it on in the morning again. Terrific sense of, of singular devotion. There's a tablet of Advaita he says that there's a level of faith, of trust in God, where you don't need to worry about material <coughs> means. The, you'll attract them in as you're moving, as you're doing things. And she had that capacity. Curious, huh? Qualities, degrees, levels of faith on what they, what they do for us. So sacrifice. You can see she's, it's, it's second nature to her to sacrifice. There's a beautiful letter of the guardian about sacrifice. First of all, the guardian over and over would stress with the friends of the pilgrims that the cause moves forward by sacrifice. It progresses by sacrifice. It does not progress without sacrifice. If we do everything we're able to do, rationally we say, well, I'm able to do this, I give to the fund, I do the things, uh, then he said the cause maintains itself. But for it to go forward, we have to sacrifice. Then he says, sacrifice is in three areas. The first one he mentions is financial. We have to give sacrifice financially in a way that hurts, in a way that we really didn't think was sensible to do, but we make that extra push. I remember one of the hands of the God saying, the funds we give to the faith, we can't, we can't monitor how they're spent. We can't say, I don't like the way the National Assembly spends its money, I'm not going to give to the fund. Or the House of Justice, I'm not going to give because I don't like what they're doing. We need to give for our sake, not for the sake of the faith. It's a blessing that, that the institutions receive funds from us and that our money could be channeled into whatever it gets channeled into. But if they take it and burn it, you still need to sacrifice for the fund. Because that's something that you need to grow spiritual. So we can't hold on to, you know, I'm going to contribute this amount for a new Baha'i Center in such a city, and I want my name on the front of it. People were giving to the House of Justice things like that the years I was there, you know, 20 years now. They, they would offer things like that, but they want, I want my name on it. I want my father's name on it. I want my mother's name on it or anything. And the house would say, if you're going to give it, you have to give it without, without strings, without conditions, you know. The second one, he said, uh, this, this one hurts as much as the first one, is the sacrifice of time. How many times did institutions or the faith is calling us to do something we say I just really don't have time I just don't have time and this materialistic lifestyle that we have we build in everything you know people want to have a full activity to the max so that they maybe they don't have time to sit and think think about what they're doing painful so we fill our lives up you know and our children's lives and we're running after our children to give them the best education, all of that sounds reasonable. They have to go to ballet, they have to go to baseball, they have to do this, they have to do that. I don't have any time. I'm sorry, I don't have any time. And Shogi Finney says, you have to find time, you have to make time, you have to sacrifice time of other things for the cause. He's saying, these are the sacrifices that make the cause progress. What's the third one? Woo! He said it's sacrifice of person, of your person. Very difficult. I've made a life goal. I want to be this. I want to be that. I want to 
in 10 years I want to be here, I want to do that. It's natural, we all make our plans, that's the way we're schooled and we're prepared and we're ambitious and we should be successful and everything like that. Sacrifice of person means sacrifice of personal goals. And maybe we don't sacrifice them completely because we have, we have the teachings that tell us we have to occupy ourselves with a profession, we have to serve and do things. That's true. But I think we understand that what nature we're talking about. Do, how much do we put me first or we put the cause first? Well, that's the challenge. So it's those three areas. Financial, time, and person, your personal goals. So probably it's useful for us from time to time to review those and see where we stand with them. Are we sacrificial in, in those dimensions of our life? And if we see the cause is not growing very much, it probably means that we're going to have to do more. And <clears throat> Shoghi Effendi stressed so much in the World Crusade that there were four steps for effective growth of the cause, effective teaching. And three of them were internal to our own being, and the fourth was external. So he said prayer, meditation, study, careful study of the teachings and the history of the faith, and then action. If you do these three, commensurate in balance with your action, then your action becomes more effective, becomes effective, becomes useful. Otherwise, we can occupy ourselves with Baha'i activities. I go to all the meetings, I go to the you know, cycles of growth and everything, but we don't see any growth. What's the matter? Why, why isn't God's growing? Why aren't more people being attracted and confirmed in the faith? Seems that it's related to the fact that we don't take enough time for prayer, meditation, and study. And he tells us the prayers, we have all kinds of prayers. Of course, the obligatory prayer is the foundation of that, but then all these other occasional prayers, prayers for teaching, tablet of Bhatma, all the different tablets we have. Then he says meditation, and he said meditation and teach and uh, prayer are two different activities, distinct activities. Don't confuse them. After we pray, after we read the writing, we have to meditate and think what the meaning of that is. What, what is. What's the intention of this thing that's been written? How does it affect my life? What, what should be my response? Or what is just the meaning of it? What are the meaning of the verses of God? Because he said they all have meanings. And then he said we don't have any fixed form of meditation in the Baha'i faith. The friends should be left free to meditate however they want to meditate. In another letter he says that we have no form of meditation but the friends would be well advised to meditate on the verses revealed by Baha'u'llah. And when you read the Igan, as you are aware, so many places he says consider, ponder, meditate, and then he gives some truth or something. That, and he's constantly invoking in us the need to think about what we're reading, not simply sometimes we recite a prayer and it's the beauty of the prayer and the song of the prayer is that we, it seems like enough and after we finish, we hang up the phone before we can hear the answer. Staying alert and meditating. And then study of the writings. My goodness, he's written um, so much on the importance of deepening and studying. And now Sir Just is stressing this in the message, most recent message. Again, it says how important it is to systematically study the writings of the faith. We need to know our literature. We need to know what the revelation is about. Most great revelation, if we if we ignore it, pathetic, really. What does he say about study? He says, with regard to the literature of the faith, we should read and reread the literature of the faith. In another letter he says we should painstakingly study the content of all the Baha'i literature. In another stage he says the Baha'is should digest the most important books of the faith. And he mentions the Gone, 
some answered questions, the dawnbreakers. Digest the contents. Chew it before you swallow it. Think about it. You know, make it your own. Make it, make you stronger. In another letter, he goes beyond that. He says the Baha'is should master the contents of these books, of these central books of the faith. In one letter, he says he hoped this man would have said he was going to study the Ugon in the in the summertime. And Shogi Fen is very pleased and congratulates him. He said he hopes that he will master each and every detail of that holy book. Most important book that's ever been revealed. Absal the Akdas is, of course, the book of laws. But as far as doctrine, as far as the teachings of God, the Kitab Yigan is the highest thing that mankind has received yet. You say, well, I've gone from reading, painstaking study, digestion, mastering, that must be it. No, there's another one. Memorize characteristic passages, he said, so that when you open your mouth to speak about the faith, these memorized words can come mix into your speech because he said those are the ones that touch the hearts, affect the people. I saw some letters a couple of years ago, Shogi Fendi writing to new believers. He said he hopes that they will use their leisure time to make a profound study of the writings of Baha'u'llah. Now these days, our leisure time is all booked up. Generally, we have a plan, you know, we're gonna have a holiday, well, we have to know where we're gonna to travel to, what we're gonna do, where we're gonna eat, what are we gonna play at, all this. He's saying, use the leisure time to study the writings of the faith. It's that kind of period in history where we need to balance these things very carefully. In one letter, yeah, he writes to man, he says that you knew Baha'i, he said, uh, he's hoping you will make a profound study of the writings of Baha'u'llah and that you'll find a couple hours a day to dedicate to this task. Oh my God. The way we live now, how are we ever going to find two hours a day to read the writings? Nobody does it. Nobody even thinks it's even feasible or admirable or possible. I'm retired, so I say, okay, I have to get to it, you know, so I get up and I get ready and I start. It takes me about 10 or 12 minutes before I fall asleep. I don't know what, where to get the strength to do more of it. I've done a little in the past, but not enough. <laughs> so think about what would happen in your life if you spend a little longer period reciting the verses of God in the morning and evening the way Baha'u'llah says in the Akdas and says really the one that doesn't do that is not faithful to the covenant. So you need to read more and the hidden words. Or the hidden words is stressed in so many ways by Abdul Baha too. He talks about it. The friends should read the hidden words morning and evening. The friends should memorize the hidden words. Maybe some of you have heard of Helen Bishop. She was a outstanding Baha'i in the Portland area, but she traveled all over the world and gave lectures in universities, very well-educated woman. She'd been in Russia, she'd been in all different places, and she was going on pilgrimage. And she herself talks, tells this story. She said, I was going to the presence of the guardian, and I was an outstanding teacher, you know. So she said, I should have some really good questions for the guardian. So she thought up some questions, which she not fully conscious, but with the idea I'll impress the guardian with these questions. <laughs> so she said she came and the guardian greeted her and seated her next to him, himself. And then she said he began to speak with such joy and enthusiasm and ask the different pilgrims at the table questions. And he never once looked at me or said anything to me. And this went on. 30 minutes, she said, in the course, then I began wondering, what's the matter? What's what's wrong here? What's wrong here? And then it came to her that she was going to perform these questions for the guardian, and how that was so bad. <laughs> how did she ever settle on such a plan? And after she thought that and swallowed it, 
The guardian turned with a smile to her and he said, and he said, you must have some questions. <laughs> and she said, I couldn't remember any of them. <laughs> but the next night I was prepared, I thought of the one that I really wanted to ask, how can I improve my teaching work? And show you Fendi work. She said, I couldn't imagine what he would answer. He said, Mrs. Bishop, you should memorize the hidden words. Then in the course of your talks and your presentations, these phrases from the divine verses will come into your speech and, and that will improve your teaching. So there you have the question of all the way from read and reread to memorize. Prayer, give much time to this, the faith says. Then meditation, thinking about the meaning of these things, particularly the meaning of the verses of God. I don't know, there's all kinds of programs of meditation, you know, where you concentrate on your navel and empty yourself of all distractions until there's nothing left but you. I don't, I don't want to be there, thank you. How can we move on? Then the study of the writings, and then he said action. The fourth of these four is action. The, the action takes on uh, dimension, takes on um, richness because of the other three. So just think about this uh, recommendation. He says, this, these are the steps, the four steps to effective service in the cause. Pretty straightforward. I think probably we're doing some of all of it already, you know. But do we do enough of it to make the teaching effective? Do we not do enough of it to attract the hearts of people? The other thing is that, you know, you may have heard this, the children of Henry said, they're waiting souls. They're souls that are here, that are waiting for the cause. Every once in a while you run across one and you teach them the faith and they, they say, why you didn't tell me about this before? Maybe you've known them a long time and they say, yeah, you knew this, you were sitting on it, why didn't you tell me? That doesn't happen very often, but it's nice when it happens. That's one thing you can feel bad about, it's okay. <laughs> I didn't know you'd be interested. So Shoghi Fendi says we should pray to find waiting souls. This is apart from the community program and plans which we have to support and keep going, the institute program, the core activities, but there's lots of spaces in between those activities when we're dealing with other human beings all day long, every day. And we need to become sensitive to finding waiting souls. So you pray in the morning, Baha'u'llah, guide me to waiting souls. Baha'u'llah, help me to recognize them when I meet them and not say, oh, they wouldn't be interested in the faith. Or how we do, you know, we kind of judge. If we're thinking about teaching, we trust each person we meet, really, going to be interested, or how can I tell them, or what can I say? It's not, not so straightforward. Waiting souls. Make that part of your morning prayers and see what happens. A balance with this other thing is, is another letter of the Guardian, very interesting letter in which he says how important it is to live the life. You all know the quote, and I don't have it in front of me, I can't quote it, but one thing and one thing alone, you've heard this quote from the man, from, from uh, Shoghi Fendi, was the degree to which our inner life and character reflect the light of the revelation. That's the one thing that's going to make the cause go forward. No elaborate teaching plans, no worldwide enterprises, nothing without that is going to make the cause go forward. We need these other things, we need a program to get into where we can express these qualities, but we have to, ourselves, institutions can't do it. They have, we have to do the transformation of our own character. And then Shoghi Fenny says that if you live the Baha'i life, he said, then Baha'u'llah will send souls to you. What a lovely promise. That's a whole lot easier than knocking on doors. <laughs> live the Baha'i life and then he sends souls to you. Okay, then we'll see how that goes forward from there. 
So I don't know, traveling around the world the last months, I was in Australia, what a wonderful Baha'i community there is in Australia, lots of lovely Baha'is serving the cause. New Zealand has a wonderful Baha'i community too. If you have a chance to travel in the world, that's a good place to go. They speak English and Persian. <laughs> Bless the. You, you pray for the Ayatollahs because they've caused the Baha'is to disperse all over the world and settle so many places. They have a, a, a lovely, a lovely spirit of the cause. The Pacific Islanders. I met a lot of Pacific Islanders in New Zealand. The summer school. There were 900 people in the summer school. How's that for a summer school? A quarter of them were native Pacific Islanders and Maoris. So they had all their children, the little ones with them. So the, 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 cho the mass of children was the oneness of mankind, a complete picture of it running around all over the school grounds. The, um, the opportunities that we have now, we have to kind of weigh them very carefully. But what, what we can do in our own lives, what the community can do. You have reflection meetings, you have cluster meetings and so on, institutions that help with that. But there has not been a stress from the House of Justice on individual teaching, the responsibility you have for individual teaching because it's so strong in Baha'u'llah's writings, in Abdu'l-Baha's writings, in Shoghi Effendi. They added <coughs> another layer of community activities. But we, it doesn't mean to set aside the other in any way. And some of the, I think some of the new friends, they get the idea that if we're just busy with the activity, the organized community activities, it's enough. No, we have a whole life plan. We have the five-year plan and we have the universal individual plan of Baha'u'llah's admonitions and his <coughs> counsels to us to try to incorporate it into our lives. And that makes, will make the difference for everything, I think. Including Corona. How are you doing in Corona? I don't know, I haven't asked. There's a whole lot of people in this room, that's very hopeful. Friends, I don't know, <clears throat> I'm running out of go power here. What do we have? That's good. So do you have any questions and answers? Because there are people sitting next to you that may be able to answer those questions. <laughs> I'll think about that a minute. I, there are a few questions I'd be fine to come to that. Thank you, Robert.
just ask a really quick question to start off that might not have a quick answer. Can you go to the mic? Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. My question is, what do you think is, maybe there isn't just one, but what do you think is kind of the most powerful daily habit or little thing that we can do on a daily basis to improve our teaching work? Just in your experience. Here says learn one of the hidden words every day. That would be help. But I think also be sure you're saying your obligatory prayers. There's not a whole lot of excuses for not saying them. I think uh, I've seen out the boss say that you're excused if you're sick and you can't get out of bed and you're, you're really sick. That would be an excuse. And the other is if you're mentally off, you're insane, you're not, you're not responsible for saying it either. So, if you miss your prayer, you have to choose one of those, you know, to see if it fits in. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise you've made a mistake. <laughs> doesn't want to stay. That's all right. Yeah. Yeah. With that, many of his life in handling for issues. Yeah. <laughs> so, many of us so it's a good excuse yeah. for a lot of people, yeah. I don't say my obligatory prayer, I say that I take Valium instead or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> the Valium should help you say the prayer, I don't know. It's really off. It's a difficult time. I was mentioning the friends earlier that Abdul Baha'i in one of his tablets. And it's, it hurts some of us because we have relatives and friends and things. He says that uh, suicide is tantamount to murder. In the eyes of God, it's murder. Because you didn't make yourself. You don't belong to yourself. You belong to him. Did you put this? Is this yours? You know, but people are so possessive. It's my life. I can take it if I want kind of thing. No. You're taking the life that you didn't create. And... Uh, you want to be careful how you use that, but it's a good medicine ahead of time. <laughs> Afterwards, it's very sad for people to hear that, but the families and things. But, the, but if we could get that out, that we're not really our, we don't belong to ourselves. We've been made with a purpose. We may be failing the purpose, but. Shogi Vinny, I understand when I got to the Holy and they said one of the things he'd said about suicide, he said, suicide is like arriving at an elaborate banquet, uninvited. Think of the embarrassment of this is not your time. What are you doing here? You know. <laughs> well, either you're fasting, or I've tired you out, or I don't know. What, we don't have any more questions. Mr. Dunbar. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> we spoke earlier. Um, about, uh, I guess I'll phrase it in the form of a question, that in society there's a lot of talk about um, love of self, self-love and self-healing and the sorts. Um, could you maybe share back some thoughts on how to reconcile some of those movements and ideologies that are around us with the Baha'i teachings and how we apply it? Yeah, I think that uh, it's, in, uh, it's in some ways it's a very me-first society. You know, we're talking about popular movements outside. Um, the adoration of pop icons and people. And the idea that you should uh, promote yourself, you know, make something of yourself, exert yourself. In, in, a, in a kind of a negative way that we need to guard against. All the advertising says, treat yourself to a favor, you know. <laughs> Again, it's putting us first ahead of everybody else. It's, it's a subtle, but it's the, it's the very character of society. There's a letter here I can read that's a bit related to that. 
regarding uh, this, obviously, there's something that comes before, but he says, unfortunately, not everyone achieves easily and rapidly the victory over self. Unfortunately. What every believer, new or old, should realize is that the cause has the spiritual power to recreate us if we make the effort to let that power influence us. <coughs> And the greatest help in this respect is prayer. We must supplicate Baha'u'llah to assist us to overcome the failings in our own characters and also exert our own willpower in mastering ourselves. The power has, the cause has the power to change and transform us, but we have to invoke it, we have to use it. Sometimes we get discouraged with ourselves. We say, I wish I could change and I don't change. And the master to uh, Mr. Getzinger, Dr. Getzinger, was in, in an interview in the Holy Land. He said that God sends us the same test over and over until, until what? Until we recognize we do not have the power to overcome the test. He sends the test, we make a resolution. I'm not going to do this anymore. Um, this is through. I'm stopping. I'm going to make a change. And we, we go forward and we fall again. We make the mistake again. And you say, well, I have to resolve. Make a stronger resolve. I'm going to do it. I'm going to change myself. And we go along again. The test comes back. We fail it again. <coughs> then the master says, the soul reaches a point with the with the problem that it's trying to overcome where it reaches despair. It loses hope that it has the capacity to change, to overcome the test. And it gets scared and it turns to God and it says, Oh Baha'u'llah, Oh God, if you don't help me, I, I can't overcome this. I see I have not the capacity to overcome it. And you throw yourself on God's power, God's mercy. Because after all, he's the only one. He's the healer of everything. And the master says, then, then the healing takes place. Then the test comes back, and you see it has no influence on you anymore. But it takes so, it's so hard for man, for humans, to give up this idea that we have to do it ourselves, or want to do it ourselves. And if we do it ourselves, we'll credit ourselves. So I, was, I overcame that. What's the matter with you? You, know, you should be able to do it too. It doesn't work that way. And so this falling on the mercy of God is the key to character transformation. But there is some effort in falling on his mercy. That seems to be clear from what's saying. He goes on in this same letter, he says, he will certainly pray for the work of the beloved cause there, and especially that new souls may be attracted and embrace the faith. He'll also pray that the believers may, for the sake of God, draw close to each other and not permit each other's shortcomings to be a cause or a source of disunity, and consequently a means of depriving thirsty souls of this life-giving message. When we focus on each other's shortcomings, we, we neutralize the unity of the faith. What this tells us is that we all have shortcomings. We all have things that if we want to look at each other, we can see lots of faults. And we can focus on those and completely turn negative in ourselves. And when the community does that, it, it's stagnant, it can't grow. So he's telling us we have to sacrifice the desire to criticize others. Because criticizing others means you're not looking at your own faults generally. It means you know you're focusing on the other people. I am I live a good to high life, but these other Baha'is are holding us back because of things they do and don't do. No, you have to leave them to God and fix yourself and realize that the unity of the cause is that we live with each other's shortcomings. They're not going to go away. We're not all going to become perfect. It's not a world of perfection. So how do we settle with this? And Shoghi Fendi then goes on to say something really strong here. The world is full of evil and dark forces. 
and the friends must not permit these forces to get hold of them by thinking and feeling negatively towards each other. This is like the cure for cancer, you know. This is a terrific line. He says, by not thinking and feeling negatively about others, smile, are you such a dear soul, but you're thinking and feeling negatively at the same time. That's not, that's not the solution. He's not saying backbiting and bad-mouthing people. He isn't saying that. Thinking and feeling, level, a very subtle interior level that I judge my fellow Baha'is and I judge the people. He says, if you do that, you will allow the dark forces to enter your being. And in another letter, he says, the dark forces can take possession of your soul. But the cause has the power to free you from that. But you, you, we know Baha'is, we know people that are in such a dark state, you know, so depressed and so agitated. What a key he's given us. The world is full of evil and dark forces, and the friends must not permit these forces to get hold of them by thinking and feeling negatively towards each other. I mean, that's a remedy for any Baha'i community that you visit. Just mentioning this, you know. No accusations, but I, each of us knows there are people in the community that bother us. Every time I see them, I I'm upset. I don't want to see them. I'm not going to go to the meeting because so and so is going to be there. Or, God help us, I'm not going to go to the meeting because my ex-wife is going to be there. <laughs> Believe me, in the Baha'i community, with all the divorces we have, if we won't go to a meeting where our ex-spouse is, we won't have any Baha'i community. <laughs> Friends, this is serious. Abdu'l Baha says, divorced couples must try to attain to being brothers and sisters with each other. They're not married, but they should be like brothers and sisters. God forbid there are things in the marriage and there are reasons and so on. But this guarding hatred or guarding, you know, distrust and everything has to somehow go away or we can't build a Baha'i community. It's very hard, I know, I realize. For, the, for divorced couples, it's very difficult to see. <coughs> but it's something to think about. Another question. So, on the topic of dark forces, actually, with the with the most recent election in America, uh, many of our friends are feeling uh, hopeless and sad. They're seeing, they they believe and they see that so much progress that has happened in years past that they view as progress is now threatened. That the rights of many groups are now threatened, and um, there seems to be a feeling of <coughs> despair around. In the Baha'i community as well, there's oftentimes a sense that, you know, what are we doing, you know, hosting a children's class when entire groups are being denied access to freedom and things like that. And at the same time, our beloved National Spiritual Assembly has written us, telling us that we must be beacons of hope and pointing out the the areas of unity and bringing forth unity and not division in this process. So my question is twofold. How do we as a Baha'i community, what view should we have of these destructive processes happening in our country and the world to, to strengthen us and how do we share that hope with others? Good question for everybody. Because <laughs> these are the times we're in now. And that's the challenge in that sense. We have to be careful that our conversation doesn't devolve into the criticism of any <coughs> present political movement or philosophy. Shirley Penny says we should be silent on those things. And when people ask them, well, why aren't you doing something about the situation? Say that the uh, Baha'is feel that these things have to be solved at an international level, that no national program of progress is really in the end going to help solve the problems of the world. They need to be discussed at an international level, discussed and acted on in that way. So maybe somebody comes back to and say that the United Nations is useless. But it doesn't have to be the United Nations. There's all kinds of other forums where people get together and talk about these things. 
I think a lot of the international organizations right now are rehearsals. They're preparing people that can serve in a world government when it's finally established. They've had experience internationally, beyond borders, you know, in, in every sense of the, of the world. But Shirley Finney says to us, take it to the international level, and the people say, well, the wives don't do anything, they just don't even pay attention to politics. Better pay attention to politics. Show you if any read the newspapers every day. You cut out the editorials. He was aware of what's going on. We shouldn't be, we're not dumb and uninterested. We're very interested, but we don't see a solution of solving national problems. I'm sorry, making America great is not the solution of the world's problems. It's, that's, that's still nationalistic. It's fine, we should improve the country too. We should serve the country and help it. But that's not the end goal. The end goal is the international one, is the recognition of the oneness of mankind and the solution for all the peoples that are suffering from the, the backward conditions in the world. Mr. Olinga told me, I traveled with him in South America. I was very honored, three months, translating his talks from English to Spanish in so many different settings, universities, jungles, tribes, cities, youth groups. He said when he was in Haifa, uh, Shogi Tindi said to him that more than one time Abdul Bahas had said to him, to the guardian, that this planet is the hell of the planets. It is the most backward of the of our system. Well, that tells you there's got to be something on the other planets if, if this is the, the hell and the backward one. But Mr. Omega said I was a little startled when he said that, you know, because it's the day of God and all these wonderful things are going to happen we have in the teachings. That's true, but it's relative to our condition that it's going to get better. Then he said, Shoghi Fendi looked directly at me and he said, the people still make war. Did you want a proof of how backward the planet is, how primitive, how hell-like, that the peoples organize themselves through their governments and go and kill millions of people? What kind of progress is it? It's really the lowest point in all of human history. We're told that in the teachings too. It's just hard to believe it because we're living in it. It's kind of, you know, like the frog sitting in the water that's beginning to boil. We, it's warm and it's nice, but it's getting hotter and hotter. And are we going to be able to jump out of the water or are we going to sit here until we cook? Lots of challenges. Pilgrim note, friends. That was a pilgrim note. You can erase it or you can put it in your pilgrim note drawer, which is what I do. I don't erase these things. I just don't hurry them. <laughs> Please. About children, education, Baha'i education, please. Well, I think you've got books and books. We have a marvelous compilation on Baha'i education. I hope. There is young people here, they have kids. Yeah. The kids need to be trained from the earliest, train them in the love of God. Very early prayers and I've seen some parents in the areas where I am that they, they're very wise about the way they make reference to God, make reference to Abdul Baha's picture, make they involve the children in a in a Baha'i kind of uh, life, a way of looking at things, and the children see them pray. The Persians are constantly they do their obligatory prayers in front of the children, but the West had training from. Christians that you hide yourself when you pray. You never, no one should know you're praying. And that's not the Baha'i concept. We read this morning a text that said the obligatory part, prayer is private, but it doesn't mean you have to say it when you're alone. And there's so many places in the world where people are living in huts, the mother, father, grandparents, the children, everybody's there. Where are you going to go that nobody's going to see you say your prayer? You have to say your obligatory prayer. 
And so I think it's good that when the children know their parents are saying the obligatory prayer, there's a routine of prayer that goes on in the house, and that that becomes a very strong influence. And you see the kiddies get up and stand next to daddy and do the movements. If they happen to be saying the medium prayer or the, or the long prayer. It's, a, it's, it, it's Think of the influence the Persian friends were here. Think of the influence this has had on your life from the beginning. You know, this is part of the pattern of life. It's part of the routine of life. Beside that, sharing the teachings, sharing stories from the teachings. Uh, I hope the communities, they have some parallel activity. Usually, I notice in the 1980 feasts, a lot of communities, they have the children say a few prayers first, and then they go off and they have their own gathering. And, but they've come to the feast. They know in the feast, they say the prayers that they're learning by heart. And children are supposed to learn prayers by heart. How do I encourage the children in the family to say prayers from memory? I'm sure that you, it's a good question, but there's a lot of people here who have had more influence and experience in teaching children than I have. I tried my best with the youth in Haifa. We had a youth class that went on for years. It went on for 31 years. So everywhere I go in the world, I've got close friends. You know? <laughs> I mean, we have guy friends anyway, but people that know me and I know them and now I, I can tell them about their grandparents who were serving in the World Center years ago. Something about a long life that adds some other possibilities. You have a few graduates of your class here today. Huh? In the back. Could you elaborate on the recent letter of the Universal House of Justice and what our role is in its application? The what? March 1st letter of the House of Justice. Oh yes, about the economics, yes. I I haven't made a thorough study of the letter myself. I've read it and it's, think about it. And uh, you, you realize that the House do, does something uh, it perceives internationally. So it's not just how does this apply to Corona? You know, obviously, it's it's the whole Baha'i world. And a four-page letter is a, it's an investment. I know when we made the did the Rizwan messages, which we felt there needed to be a message, they used to be um, consulted. We'd have an initial consultation where each house member had a chance to speak openly in the meeting of the house about what they felt was the achievement of the year or what was the theme of the past year that was memorable, or what is the theme that we should put for the next year that's coming, what's the next step that we should take. So it was a kind of broad, and it went on usually for hours, six, eight hours. And several people would take notes. And then uh, the house decided, okay, now a first attempt, a first draft should be made. So they either name one member or two members, make a first draft on the basis of these consultations. So then they would wrestle with that, and after maybe 10 days, they would come back with a message. With a message because there were so many themes and things. Um, trying to make it coherent and so on. And then it would be read out in the meeting. And then the house, after it was read out, would go paragraph by paragraph, sentence by sentence, and talk about is this is this the right balance? Is this paragraph begun here? What about the idea of such and such it isn't reflected here? Take note, add these, add that phrases in, those phrases. Remember what Baha'u'llah said with respect to this. That would go on seven or eight times. Go out of the meeting some days and then the draft would come back and then it would be polished. And and finally, they said the last third of the message needs to be in the middle, and this one needs to be at the end. Things like that happen. It really was quite an interesting process to, to, to see how, how it would come about. And we try to finish it all by novels. Then we would get handed a message at Rizwan, 
the House of Justice, the message of the House of Justice. I swear it was like a fresh message from the House of Justice. I say we wrote this. We wrestled over this. I don't remember. I remember it, but I don't remember it. It's all fresh and it was all new at RISM. A curious process. So you, you need to, uh, that's a message, usually the house messages of this kind of character, it's good to try and outline them. Try to take the, what's the theme of the paragraph and then what are the sub-themes and identify them. Because by thinking about what they are, you, you notice them, you find them. Whereas in a general reading of it, you may miss it. You know? Show me if any letters are like that. His books are like that. You can outline them. It's very easy, very organized. And his writings, you can all read. You can read the, the writings of the Guardian in meetings and quote for them. Why? Because he wrote them out loud. Conor said he didn't like to be alone when he was writing his messages. Well, there was nobody but Conor, and she sat in there and heard the whole of God Passes By read out. He'd read the sentence if it was balanced, if it sounded right. He'd write it, and then he'd read it, then he'd revise it, then he'd read it again. Sitting there working on his lips. Of course, she said, you know, she wasn't arguing back or saying anything. She said, I was knitting, actually, a lot of the time. I just, he liked the company. And he had such a difficult time um, with the 10 years from 41 to 51 with the family. It was so difficult. They, as a band, opposed him. And they poisoned each other. And they poisoned the mother and father. The mother and father of Shogi Fendi died during that period. You see any message? Some grandmother died somewhere. There's a message from Shoghi Fendi. His own mother died. He never wrote a line. He buried them in the Baha'i Cemetery, but on their graves are initials rather than their full names. Mm. Mother and father. Maria Ghanum told us, she said, I never saw Shoghi Fendi smile. For 10 years, he never smiled. And there's one photograph of him in that period. It is so... It's a password picture, but it's so, he's so drained, he's so sad that he just, Thou said, don't, don't publish that, put it away. And what changed it? These pioneers that went to Africa in the two-year plan, the African plan, 51 to 53. They went there and they started having successes. And they sent photos of the new African believers and so on. And that changed the spirit of the guardian. And he was going to have a third seven-year plan. He had two seven-year plans. There was going to be a third seven-year plan. With the success of the African campaign, he said he's enlarging the seven to a ten-year crusade. And it's because of that, Rio Honum said that when I we made the monument of the guardian in London, that where you face, when you face the, the resting place and towards the east, the globe, the front of the globe is Africa. She said, I did that because that changed the spirit of the guardian. Hmm. Please. Having traveled so many countries and experiencing a lot of events and happenings, is there one that stands out for you, that comes to your mind, that enlightening or positive or wonderful? Well, you know, because I had the privilege of being in the World Center, we were there 37 years, so a lot of things happened in that time. But one of the great highlights of that whole period was the centenary of Baha'u'llah's ascension. Uh, that was commemorated in the Holy Land. And that was the time that the House of Justice finished the scroll of the Knights of Baha'u'llah, the added ones that after the passing of the Guardian needed to be added to the scroll and displayed the scroll in the seat of the House of Justice and invited as special guests all the Knights of Baha'u'llah that were still alive in the world. And they came and they saw the 
scroll and they saw their names on the scroll. And they came as witnesses when the scroll was placed by Rehoboam in a, a vault under the front door, inside, just inside the threshold of the shrine of Baha'u'llah. This was deposited for, forever. That was a very moving, wonderful event. And represented, you know, brought us back to the there were the knights of Baha'u'llah, and they were raised up by Shoghi Effendi for this world crusade. The, those were very difficult years, friends. You can only imagine many of you were living through them with the martyrdoms in the world, in the cradle of the faith. And the World Center was like, you know, it's, it's, it's the heart, so the nerve center of the faith. So that, that news would come in the middle of the night. Mostly Hushman Fatihzan would get these calls any time of the night. He was on alert and, and hearing about new deaths and Massif Arhangi, the council finally was killed. Massif Arhangi had been arrested and was in Evan prison for some months before he, he was executed. <coughs> and he was very popular. He served everybody in the Baha'i spirit. He would even treat the, the families of the, the guards and the keepers of the prison. They were all beholden to him. When the order came for his execution, they didn't want it. They fussed and argued about not, not doing what the government was telling them. And there was one time he, he said that uh, there was a general who was called to be, to be executed. And he started trembling. And he couldn't stand up and he couldn't walk. And so the, the prison authorities called Dr. Farhangi, said, please go and talk to him. You can, we know you can solve this problem. And he goes and he talks to this man. And the general stands up like a soldier and he walks out there and gets shot. And everybody hears the stories, you know. Dr. Farhangi was doing it. The last time he saw his wife, his wife told afterwards, told the story, she said the last. He said, you know, he said several auxiliary board members have been killed. And they're on the other side. And there's no counselor to direct them. I think pretty soon it's going to happen. The counselor has to go too. And two weeks later he was executed. And the soldiers, the guards that were to shoot him, they all came to him, some of them weeping, begging that they didn't, they didn't want to do this, they couldn't do this. How could they do this? And he had candies, and he put candies in the hands of each of the executioners. And he begged them, I only ask you to just aim at my heart. I want my heart to be given. And they went and they shot him and they threw this body in a morgue. They had a huge like factory places that they threw the bodies. And then they rode all over it, you know, scum of the earth and filth. And they rode in marker pens that you couldn't wash off. The bodies got buried that way, that way. Terrible, insulting things. And. Uh, the night of his execution, the friends had gathered with the wife, obviously, to pray and be together. And suddenly in the middle of their prayer meeting, there's banging on the door. And it's some of these guards. So they addressed as guards and what's going to happen? They said, where is Mrs. Farhangi? And they took her, they took them into her. And as they saw her, they fell on their faces weeping and asked her for begging her forgiveness. Such stories. This was coming to the World Center every day there was something. It was very hard. I wasn't on the house at that time. It was very hard for the House of Justice. I mean, getting the shock of this. Never mind the friends in Iran, but they all knew the things too. Dr. Brahim, they wanted to remove his body to take it to bury. But a thousand Baha'is had gathered in front of the factory place where they'd stored the bodies. 
And the guy in charge says, you can't take the body out that way. There's too many people. He said, bring the car, car around in the back, behind the big wall. And they got ladders and they took Dr. Farhangi over the wall and into a truck and took him to the cemetery. And then there was a huge gathering at the cemetery too. You can imagine a counselor having been martyred. I think, you know, it, uh, it sobered up the Western Baha'is. Western Baha'is, you know, it was decades we didn't have any deaths for faith, for belief. And when that happened, it, you suddenly had to ask yourself as a Western Baha'i, this is a religion which I could be killed for. How would I, how would I manage? These people were taken to kill, they, they were killed we're told, if you renounce your faith, if you denounce the faith, you won't be killed. You'll be freed. We'll put you on television. Everything will be wonderful. Are we ready? Are all of us ready to face those kind of tests? You know? We may not have to, but it's a good, it's sobering to think about it and meditate about it and realize. There's so many wonderful stories. If you read the stories of the history of the faith, that it's a relief to you because here's an old man that they've taken and they're giving him the bastinado. That is, his feet are up in the air tied to a stick that's being held and the man is whipping the feet. And he's whipping and whipping until the, all the bottom of the foot is sliced in pieces, bleeding and so on. And this old man has covered, this is a story from there, he's covered his head, you know, and he's not crying, he's not something, is he dead? What's happened? Nothing. So they lift up the thing and he's picking his teeth while this is going on. What? <laughs> because the power of God and power of Baha'u'llah can remove the pain completely. So many of them said they didn't feel it. The first blows maybe, but after that, Disappear. Miracles. Mm. <coughs> what we can be like about the root to live in two sets of clothes and have detachment, especially this material country which we live and everything we shop. After all, and the life is starting in this country. Yeah. I want to see you in a new outfit every day. Every day. You can't wear the same clothes. What's that? <laughs> the guys get away with it. They can wear it. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. This is again, it's meditating on how much are we influenced by the writings, how much are we influenced by the materialistic society, by the phrasing, by the, by the culture that wants us to conform and makes us uncomfortable when we don't conform. Except we can dispel the discomfort by the writings, by the promises from the writings. 